Churchill Avenue and the rail crossing there is the subject of a lot of debate in Palo Alto right now uh, with the looming electrification of Caltrain, tripling of ridership uh, on Caltrain over the next uh, several decades. Um, it's the subject of your cover story today, Janati. So we'll be talking about the Churchill Avenue uh, intersection as well as more broadly the grade separation effort. Um, let's start with why Churchill has all the attention because there's two other intersections that are currently being considered um, for redesign, mandatory redesign, which is uh, Charleston and East Meadow and Palo Alto Avenue in the north has been kind of put off to the side. Um, why Churchill? I feel like Churchill right now is getting most of the conversations because just in the last few months we've had um, different neighborhoods who live around Churchill coming up with very different ideas and uh, sort of clashing over the city's vision for this particular crossing. I do feel like um, in the south um, the problem is probably much worse. There's the, the, both the Charleston and the East Meadow crossings are considered much more dangerous by the FRA and um, mm -hmm. accident prone. But I do feel like there's more of a sense of consensus mm -hmm. um, of what neighbors there don't like to see and do like to see. Mm -hmm. Namely, trench is kind of a popular idea and we haven't seen too much resistance to that. Churchill, on the other hand, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit more sensitive because there's less right of way for Caltrain. So if you do any kind of major engineering options, um, it would probably require, at the very least, um, something like a viaduct would be very close to the yards, much yeah. more so than it would be on the south Palo Alto crossings. Mm -hmm. And also because um, even though it's, it's the cheaper option, um, like the closure of Churchill that we're discussing, to cars, than, yeah. than the one that's uh, that was being considered for South Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. Um, just the variety of different neighborhoods who live out there make this a little more politically explosive at this particular time, which again may change as the great separation conversation unfolds in the next few months. Yeah, you talk to neighbors from uh, Churchill, North Old Palo Alto, uh, Southgate, Professorville. Mm -hmm. The impacts just seem to be this like Rubik's Cube of what's going to happen with the traffic if Churchill is closed, what's going to mm -hmm. happen with the homes if it's not closed. Um, and in some ways, with the uh, amount of funding that's going to be needed um, to execute some of these projects, it's, it's, it sort of surprises me that um, we've got sort of essential philosophical differences underlying everything. Not a lot of people are saying, well, that costs $300 million, so we can't do that. Um, it's all about kind of the, the real on-the-ground conditions that people are living with. I would say that some of the people who live on Churchill in North Old Palo Alto mm -hmm. uh, do point at the money as one big issue. Mm -hmm. And they're basically saying, we're going to need to spend hundreds of millions of dollars for the South Palo Alto options. And that's one of the many reasons they don't like things like the viaduct, which would cost more than $300 million. Mm -hmm. They're saying, since we're going to be spending so much money down there, it would make more sense to consider it a cheaper, less dramatic solution up here. But in general, um, I think you're right. I think uh, a lot of it is a debate over what kind of impacts should be tolerated and what kind should not. Yeah. It seems like there is some uh, accusation, maybe it's understandable, that uh, some people are focusing too much or uh, on their own kind of uh, situation that, or their own experience that they're going to go through whether it's the person who's going to look out her backyard and see the viaduct 20 feet in the air or the person who's going to lose their home, while other people are kind of uh, citing the broader good, you know, what's best for the city. Um, you spoke to a lot who's of Who's doing that? Some of the people you talked to. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, is there, is there a sense of what's in the broader community's best interest here as opposed to the conflict between the different neighborhoods, which is very understandable that they've, they're have they looking out for their own interests? I think there is. I, I don't feel like, um, I mean, we have the XCAP committee, and a lot of this is neighborhood people, but a lot, some of them aren't. Some of them are people who, I mean, they live in Palo Alto, but they've been involved with rail in a much broader sense. Like, I don't think Nadia Nike, for example, who chairs the committee, is, has a, you know, has expressed a very strong preference of one option or the mm -hmm. other, but... And, so are they playing the role of trying to, to bring these opposing viewpoints together and looking for you yeah. know win-win solution? If there's and, yeah, uh, bring, bring viewpoints together, come up with different options that, other, that everybody could agree with, maybe get more information from consultants that may help get the decision. And I'm hoping that the city council will have the broader <laughs> community interest as opposed to follow one neighborhood's lead, which makes sense to me because they live in different neighborhoods. So I think for this particular story, we focused on the neighborhood level, but um, eventually when the decision gets made, uh, I'm sure they're going to consider all sorts of factors. And if you don't believe me, you can look at this matrix, which is how the decision will be made. 
So, yeah. So I these are all the options. Th and these are all the options, and these are all the factors uh, that the council is considering, the pros and cons. So, um, yeah, the, the neighborhood impacts are certainly part of the list, but there's many others, including cost, you know, creek impacts, all sorts of things that are ultimately going to... Uh, be delved into further as a decision gets made. It's just we haven't gotten there yet in the process. I think the people who cite sort of broader community interests often land on traffic because that's the thing that most people, more people would be affected by. Um, so explain to us what the Embarcadero Road Alma uh, issue is and why some people are opposed to the closure of Churchill, what they think is going to happen. Well, I think pretty much everybody admits that the kind of interchange between Alma and Embarcadero is a little tricky. Uh, as, as you know, there's there's no like direct turn from one to the other. You have to kind of go through this like what they call the informal overleaf in Professorville, um, and so there's already traffic backups. And I think a lot of people who live in that area, like on Kingsley, Lincoln, that area, uh, believe that if you close Churchill, which is one of the two options that are being evaluated right now, mm -hmm. if you close it, then they assume just a lot more people are going to be taking Embarcadero. Um, yeah. And because of that, yeah. the, the backups they already experienced are going to get worse. Quite a few are going to take Oregon, presumably, but um, regardless. So mm -hmm. their main concern is um, if you close Churchill, as many of those who live near Churchill, but certainly not all, mm -hmm. advocate for, um, there needs to be very, very kind of convincing proof that they will make improvements in the Embarcadero Alma area. Yeah. That's not going to make the traffic situation even worse. There, there's a lot of uh, mention in your story about uh, sort of unspecified mitigation measures that, that, mm -hmm. that the engineers think can be done to ameliorate what you're describing there. Mm -hmm. can, can you give us any more details on what those might be? Because I, th I think they're, they're pretty vague right now as to how one would deal with the problem you just described. There's new lights, uh, new traffic signals. There's the widening of Alma and kind of modifications to Embarcadero so that you, you'd be able to. There's actually a diagram on the fact sheet that I'm looking at right now because it is an engineering drawing. But essentially, you would um, eliminate the need to use this cloverleaf and allow cars to kind of go directly from Alma to Embarcadero, okay. which is now impossible because of the great separation of Embarcadero. Well, well cars right now are using um, the King's Lick. Kingsley shortcut from right. Alma to... They're, I mean, let's not call it a clover leaf because what well, it really is is just cutting through the neighborhood to the right. first available opportunity to turn right onto Embarcadero. Right, I'm yeah. using the residence terminology, but they're saying it's, <laughs> they're being used as a clover leaf, yeah. basically. Yeah, yeah. But, and so the, the, the possible way to deal with that is to put a, an actual um, off-ramp, basically, off of Alma that, cir that circles directly down into Embarcadero east westbound. Yeah, I mean, um, looking at this diagram, it's actually east eastbound. Uh, westbound and eastbound, because there's a signal. It would make it into a full four-way intersection. <laughs> right. and um, Prior to going under the tracks. Right. Okay. Right. So, yeah, and uh, I think it's, it's still kind of a concept, so I don't think there's been really a buy-in from the neighbors, and a lot of the people in Professorville don't think that's going to work. Because and that would not require the taking of any homes? Uh, the consultants are saying it, it would not, yeah. Huh. That's, uh, and uh, and there, there's a fact sheet that just came out like earlier this week, which kind of has this diagram that I'm looking at right now. And there's, there's other components as well. Um, I mean, there's... Uh, Let's see, I, I, can, I can go through all of this <laughs> Please <don't. laughs> if, if you like, but um, I would probably just direct readers to kind of look at that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but it, it, basically it includes widening Alma, creating kind of a new ramp onto Embarcadero, adding new signals and kind of, and there's also a new overpass for bikers that's kind of uh, west of that interchange. I want to know how much data has been collected by the consultants to sketch out what the scope of the uh, traffic impact would be. I mean, I'm hearing like um, half, half the cars will go to Oregon and half of the cars will go to Embarcadero if Churchill is closed to traffic. Mm -hmm. Are there, are there intense studies of, of the impact there so have been far, some or studies. is it just predictions? No, they've done, some, they've done some counts. So there was actually a, a former traffic consultant that worked for the city before that did traffic counts, like I think it was last December, and then mm -hmm. they've replaced the consultant since then, and I think the new one, which is Hexagon, did its own traffic counts, and then it found that the previous ones were actually showed more cars, so they're using the prior counts, which are more conservative, because you want to get the bigger impacts. So they have done actual studies and kind of looking at how many cars are going in each direction, hmm. and they did their own predictions like hmm. as to how many cars are going to go to the other crossings. 
And just at this meeting that was earlier this month, they had like a draft report that hasn't really been vetted yet by the city, which kind of shows what the level of service impacts will be of mm -hmm. this concept, um, both on the Churchill area and in Embarcadero. And so uh, we're going to be reporting more on that once the city reviews it. But, uh, but the basic uh, conclusion was there's going to be some impact on Embarcadero, but it could be reduced to a less than significant level, which not everybody finds convincing. Yeah. Projects often have that label. Palo Altans are often skeptical of the bases for predictions on traffic. Well, and I think this is particularly tricky because all of us can form an opinion about the solutions to this problem without having any particular expertise. Because Except me, I'm not allowed to form an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> you can. But you know, we we all we all are, have experienced the traffic conditions, and so I mean, we all can come up with our own solution to these problems. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's been a real reluctance on the part of the city, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. To doing what some have recommended, which is to sort of test drive the idea mm -hmm. of a closure at Churchill, and let's okay. just look and see where that traffic goes. Mm -hmm. um, what's the resistance to that? I mean, I understand that there's always a reluctance to test something when you don't have the mitigation measures in place because then it's going to be the worst possible outcome. But it seems to me that could potentially provide at a fairly easily and quickly a sense of what the traffic behavior would look like. And I think many of the people, particularly in Professor Hill, would absolutely agree with that. And in fact, some have called for the city to do just that, mm -hmm. close Churchill temporarily for a week or two. I don't believe the city is necessarily resisting it. I just feel like they haven't gotten there yet. I feel like the last couple of meetings with the, where the council discussed this topic, they've been totally preoccupied with things like removing the citywide tunnel, which was the darling option of people who talked about the broader mm -hmm. uh, kind of city goals, to go back to your earlier question. Right. And, and they've been focusing on outreach strategies, on like process things, forming the X cap. So they haven't re this, the full council hasn't really even discussed, like have, have it like a really substantive discussion about these options, aside from elimination of other options in prior meetings. Well, where's the staff on this? I mean, what, if, if, if doing a, a test closure is a good idea, why do we need to wait for the council to come up with that idea and act on it? Why doesn't the staff propose for the next two weeks, let's close this off? For one week, let's make it so that you can, that nothing else changes, and for the second week, make it so that you can't go through Professorville to get to Embargadero and see where the traffic goes there. I mean, it just seems like a fairly easy thing to That's an excellent initiate. question for staff. Okay. <laughs> but, but, but I do think it, it would have a dramatic impact regardless, and I'd, I'd be, um, or at least have some impact closing Churchill. So I can see why staff could be reluctant to do something like that without council guidance, because they'd be the ones getting the angry calls later. But, um, but, but like I said, I wouldn't be surprised if the council ultimately chooses to do that, particularly if um, further on in the winnowing down process, they start leaning towards closure Churchill and against the viaduct, which is the only other options currently on the table. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, stay tuned. They haven't gotten there yet, but they, they, they might. Does the school district have a position on, on this? They've been, um, they had a representative on the expanded community advisory panel. It was Barbara Best, but I think recently they decided not to participate in these meetings. And so uh, the, the position they had has basically been vacant since then for the last few weeks. Well, and when I say position, I mean, do they do, have they expressed a view of whether Churchill should be closed or not? Because oh, the, the, the amount question? of traffic to Pali in the morning mm -hmm. is substantial on yeah. Churchill. I, I haven't heard the school district's position, but as you know, that's Elena, Elena probably deals with them much more, so that might be a question for her. Mm -hmm. Certainly in the public meetings, I have not seen school people come out and advocate for or against that option. Mm -hmm. but, but it's another one of those things that I feel like as we get closer to the actual decision point, uh, if we get closer to it ever, okay. uh, I imagine the school district will be one of many stakeholders who will probably have a say at that point. I think right now we're still kind of in the filtering out process, and uh, as you know, it's a lot easier to get people's opinions once you have a project on the table, and it's mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. it's taking a long time to get to that point. Yeah, this is clearly a complex project. Some say it's the biggest in city history, um, but there have been expectations that we would be at a preferred um, alternatives um, decision by now. Mm -hmm. So. There have been many complications, and it just seems like more players are being added um, to the decision-making process. And the city is now launching sort of a new community outreach um, right mm -hmm. now. So 
in a nutshell, why are we not at a decision point right now? Is it just that the previous staffs or uh, elected leaders just didn't anticipate how difficult this would be? Um, how many people would need to weigh in? Uh, why is it still Or is it fear of churning? making a decision? Yeah. You know, what, what's the... Have you followed the Economic Bridge discussion? How long did that take? <laughs> this is that times like a hundred, <laughs> times a thousand. I know Bill's been following it. Mm. Read your editorial. But um, yeah, I, I think uh, many answers. Part of it is because it's very complicated and Palo Alto takes a long time to get to decisions that are much less complicated. Uh, mm. But yeah, as you mentioned, they've missed it, all their deadlines for making a decision. They were mm. going to decide by the end of 2018. Right. And then they were going to decide by this fall. Now they're going to decide by next spring. Mm -hmm. possibly, mm -hmm. but that's the current kind of goal um, yeah. in May. And uh, I think it just has to do with the, the city hall culture of wanting to do analysis and then do yeah. more analysis. And uh, there, there were options that have kind of made the process stretch for a long time, like, for example, the citywide tunnel, mm -hmm. which many years ago was deemed kind of probably too expensive, especially the way it was proposed, which mm -hmm. is kind of just from north end of Palo Alto to the south end and then trains kind of reemerge, and you know for a regional project it's kind of hard to plan for these things but lots of people including many council members um, kind of kept that in in the mix and there were 35 options or something like that a couple of years ago mm -hmm. so it's just taken a long time to kind of filter through the, and eliminate dozens of options and and for something like this it's like you've, you've had so many you had like a revolving door of consultants and mm -hmm. traffic consultants so it's basically the Palo Alto process to the nth power. I guess that's kind of what's holding it up. But also the recognition that this is a huge project with enormous implications. Mm -hmm. So I think um, it's reasonable for them to want to err on the side of caution. Yeah, and there seems to be a thought process that, that Palo Altans go through in particular, because everyone is so expert at various things, that maybe there's a solution that hasn't been proposed yet. That'll make yeah. everybody happy. <laughs> and it's still happening. It's in search of the... Yeah, yeah. I mean, Impossible. There, yeah, your story mentioned another option that came up, which was a, a shallower um, sort of underpass, overpass thing yeah. for Churchill. Nicknamed the ditch by those who I think aren't really into it. The ditch. Yeah, and, yeah. and, and it doesn't help that like, well, I don't know, it, it may help reach a solution, but it doesn't help make things faster that the mm -hmm. council last year kind of empowered the new committee to consider new options. Mm -hmm. I feel like yeah. it, it's, it's a lot of like a one step forward, two step backwards as far as getting to a decision. They eliminate mm -hmm. a bunch of options, then bring, they, bring some of they reopen back. a few. It's kind of, so yeah, it's kind of taken, it's taken a long time. Yeah. And they've also delegated a lot of the like hard work of analysis to citizen committees. Mm -hmm. So the council doesn't get to make too many decisions. When mm -hmm. they do, it's like once, once or twice a year. Mm -hmm. and that just helps stretch the process out even further. Are there two groups right now, the XCAP and a community working group? Or, or oh, it's one. It's actually just, the, 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 the former group kind of evolved into the new one. It, it, the, the new one includes members of the former group, okay. many of the neighborhood representatives, but it, it also includes additional members like Larry Klein, Ju Judy Kleinberg, mm -hmm. like they used to have the school board member. So it's, it's bigger. It's meant to be kind of, um, uh, it has a broader mission. It advises the council directly as opposed to dealing purely with staff. Mm -hmm. It now has a chair and a vice chair, and it has the ability to kind of have a say in its own agenda, which it hasn't in the past. So I feel like um, the way the group is reconstituted, it's meant to help the city get closer to a decision. They have a little more power, mm -hmm. but it's still going to take a while. Okay. What role does Stanford play in this at all? Are they on the, on the XCAP committee? They're not. I think they're, they're just one of the stakeholders that's probably going to be commenting when this process gets forward. Um, I mean, the city was certainly hoping that Stanford would pay a good chunk of the project um, as part of the GUP process, which mm. we now know has has gone off the rails. But um, <laughs> Off the rails. Sorry, oh, that, that wasn't <laughs> I swear that was unintentional. Come on, I used it last time. <laughs> anyway. So, uh, yeah, they, they haven't had a very vocal position. Like, you don't, you don't see the Stanford people coming out on rail discussions. Yeah, and is there any data that shows what percent of the traffic that cross that uses Churchill is Stanford bound or from Stanford? Not that I've seen, but uh, as I said, when, when the new hexagon study uh, gets vetted by the city and gets publicized, I'll have a better mm -hmm. chance to see where different cars go. Uh, it might not say Stanford, but towards the Stanford area, you know, I'm not sure who goes to the hospital or who goes to the university, but we might have a better say at least in what streets people are turning. 
So I have a question. Um, we've got a viaduct option for Churchill, and we've got viaduct options for South Palo Alto's um, intersections. Has anyone studied or proposed just a citywide viaduct from presumably Homer all the way to We South have. Palo Alto? I think, yeah, I was going to say, the guy across from <laughs> <Yeah>. me proposed it. <laughs> Has anyone studied that? It ha I don't think it's been completely studied. People have proposed it. I remember Cedric de la Bougardier kind of talked about the viaduct. There's probably mm -hmm. a few other folks, um, mm -hmm. and it did get revived. So, okay. But uh, so to, uh, to avoid the sort of roller coaster. Effect. Yeah, but I don't. But the city council hasn't really seriously considered it to date hmm. because they've been preoccupied with process issues and eliminating yeah. the tunnel. Yeah, yeah, and so. just to put a word in on the viaduct, um, <laughs> since, yeah. since, since per this is my personal favorite. Mm -hmm. um, to me, the, the, the main reason for considering it is the opportunity to create a green belt underneath it that connects the entire city. Mm. And I think that that's the, the ability for people to use their bikes and their feet to get places in this city um, would be enhanced greatly if you developed a park-like um, walkway, bikeway, a place to go running that went the entire length, yeah. or almost the entire length yeah. of the city. Mm -hmm. So, they of course, say, the people in Mariposa would have something to say about well, that. Well, and I totally get the idea that that means everybody's going to have to, the view, the view problem from a bunch of backyards, um, mm -hmm. and I think the noise issue is less, less a factor because I think the electric um, trains will be much less noisy, mm -hmm. um, but... Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I get why people don't like it, but well, it's, it's a trade-off. Every, every one of these options uh, carries a lot of difficult trade-offs. Um, what about freight trains? I to have no opinion. <laughs> <laughs> freight trains, can they go in viaducts? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's nothing. Because that's always been an issue, like what freight trains need versus what the electrified trains need. No, I mean, they, it, it's just a matter of, of the rate of... The incline? Yeah, the incline. Yeah, I think freight becomes more of an issue when you talk about like tunnels and how big the tunnels should be. The, and when you the talk exhaust. about 1% versus 2%, mm -hmm. freight has yeah. its own kind of standards which complicate that discussion. Yeah. But I haven't heard freight come up too much in the particular viaduct versus closure yeah. debate. Janati, is there anything about this process that could be referendized in the end? Oh. <laughs> oh, this, it, it, <laughs> just, just, sorry to throw I'm that curve at you, but I'm speechless. since a lot of things end up on the ballot in Palo Alto, I'm wondering if there's a mechanism to mm. do that given the nature of the approvals that this um, involves. Yeah, get back to me after May. <laughs> First of all, I got to see what they approve. I mean, there is a process for, for referendizing uh, council's decisions, mm -hmm. but uh, I really haven't looked at that mm -hmm. yet because we're so we're still months away from the actual. And has decision. there been any talk about an advisory measure going on, perhaps next fall's ballot to seek public input on these these options? Not directly. Indirectly, I'd say that the, the proposed business tax, um, one of the major right. sources where this would go, would be great separation. So I'm guessing if people are adamantly against uh, what the city's trying to do in great separation, they could vote against that, basically deprive the city of the funding it would need. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's no specific kind of drive that's being organized to, to put anything in the 2020 ballot as far as I know. Yeah. There's still some time, and I know that residents are in in increasingly engaged. We've seen lots of petitions from all sorts of neighborhoods, north of Palo Alto, the Charleston people, and more recently the Professorville people have submitted their own letters with signatures kind of mm -hmm. lobbying for their kind of neighborhood view, point of view, but I haven't seen anything citywide yet. Was attendance at the community meeting earlier this month um, indicative of like strong community awareness now and engagement? Well, we're still trying to increase it, hence the story, but uh, <laughs> there was about 150, 200 people kind of, it's comparable to prior, um, mm -hmm. to prior hearings, mm -hmm. so I guess, um, uh, from the people I've spoken to, it sounds like most of their neighbors are at least aware of that this is happening, even if they might not be as steeped in the specifics. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think more people know about it, at least on a surface level, mm -hmm. but probably not on too deep a level. Okay. But, uh, not at the tunnel it, level. Not at the tunnel level. And I think <laughs> the, the city council is going to be trying hard to change that just in the next few months. The, I think you referenced kind of the new plan that they have. There's going to be town hall meetings and more community hearings and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. That's going to try to get people more steeped in this. But... Um, but yeah, 150, 200 people, I think, is a good turnout for a community meeting. But for yeah. a project like this, it, it's clear that there's still like a huge majority who would need a lot more information before they could kind of 
yeah. give a constructive opinion on great separation. Okay, and that's the city's goal is to get everyone involved. Yeah, so we'll the see decision if they can, can do be that final by May. We'll see okay. if that happens. All right. Thanks for the discussion on this topic. Mm -hmm. um, that wraps up this edition of Behind the Headlines. If you think there's other people who would be interested in knowing about grade separations in the Churchill Avenue, um, hit the share button below and send the link to your friends. Uh, for all of Palo Alto news, you can go to Palo Alto online. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.